Hey everyone, Rizu Gaming here, and I just wanted to do a bit of a follow-up to my video about asteroid starting conditions. So <laughs> here's a video about all the different world traits that the asteroids in Oxygen Not Included can start with. And again, it's, it's a case of there being some information on the wiki, but it's not particularly complete. And I just wanted to summarize all of it here uh, to help you guys <laughs> see what you're looking for when you're starting a new game of Oxygen Not Included. I know the early game is really fun and the world traits can make a big difference to how some asteroids play. And there's also some really interesting combinations of world traits that can lead to completely different experiences uh, in the late game, which I'll get into later. But yeah, <laughs> I just got, just to start, here's a picture of um, a seed that failed to generate because the world traits were getting too spicy and they were overlapping with each other. <laughs> um, let me know in the comments if you've seen this message before. But uh, yeah, let's uh, get cracking. So, let me just move myself down here. The first trait I want to talk about is just the boulders. So these are fairly standard. You're always going to have some world traits on certain asteroid types. And this is kind of like a filler world trait that doesn't really do a huge amount. Uh, but it just adds these granite and obsidian boulders to the map. And there's four different traits regarding these. You can see on the right what these... Um, what these boulders look like um it's about 75 percent obsidian and then just granite on the inside uh some igneous rock the obsidian is super duper hard digging level so you need a level three digging skill dupe to dig through it so it can block stuff in the early game it can stop you from building something in that area so you should be aware of those um and what i've done is i've got the full i've got four different um asteroids with the same world traits otherwise and i've highlighted the boulders in pink so you can see how big they are relative to the asteroid this is a classic start in all of these cases um so the small ones are still fairly big this is a small boulder here um so it'll take up a fair chunk of space and then the medium and the large ones can get even bigger the large ones can be as big as whole biomes um you're not guaranteed to get the amounts showed up here um, the game will try and place up to 20 small boulders, 10 medium boulders, uh, 5 large boulders, but other biome generation uh, features, etc. will stop these boulders from forming. Like, you can see this one, this one over here has been cut off, this one over here has been cut off. So you'll typically get less than, uh, you'll typically get less than these values. And mixed, mixed boulders just adds a range of different boulder sizes. So expect chaos <laughs> um yeah not super interesting the boulders start at the normal biome temperature so in most biomes they'll be temperate on rhine maps the boulders will also be cold they'll also be warm on iridio so just bear that in mind this one down here in the oil biome was oil biome temperature and then the abyss light was here and then it went into the magma biome so you can't really do too many temperature shenanigans with it it's just an obstacle really Nothing, nothing hugely significant about these. Generally takes a place of more interesting trait. But uh, yeah. Next up we have the glaciers. So the glaciers are a bit more interesting in that they're, they're the same sort of size as the large boulders. And they're made of ice, polluted ice, and wolframite. And they're very cold. They generally generate at around minus 60 degrees C. And they don't have any sort of insulation around them, so they will cool down the environment near them. They'll suck all the heat up over time. Um, and it's very cold. So these could be quite useful. I mean, first of all, you can dig through the ice without many issues if you really want to uh, get through the area. It will be very cold, and as the area starts to heat up, any tiles of ice that you dig up that stuff can liquefy on the ground, so just be aware of that. Um, but what I like to do is I like to tend to dump hot liquids on them because A, you'll eventually want to melt this ice and have access to the water. Mining a tile will give you a 50% penalty to the mass of whatever you dig up. If you melt it, then you'll get 100% of the mass back, so you'll get twice as much ice, uh, water out of this letting it melt as you would mining it. And also, you're going to be generating a lot of hot liquids anyways. Like, if you've got a metal refinery, that's going to be producing hot coolant 
on a regular basis. So you can either dump that on the glacier directly, or you can just run it past on like a on like a radiant pipe or something, and heat it up over time. And this could last you quite a while. Um, these glaciers can save your life on Iridio and Oasis starts because they can give you a, a little cold spot that you can work with. That you can dump some heat into that you can grow plants near. It will still need management because it's it's extremely cold, but potentially very useful. And uh, yeah, if you want to dig up the ice to make temperature plates as well, that's pretty valid. Um, they also contain wolframite, a little bit of wolframite, not too much. Uh, you might be able to see a couple of isolated metal tiles around the glacier. Um, but this will let you make a small amount of tungsten on maps where you otherwise wouldn't have access to this. And yeah. The other thing I was going to say about these was they contain weaswort seeds. Uh, they can contain between sort of five and eight, and they'll contain other buried plants from the biomes that they're overlapping as well. But the wheeze warts are important because you can you can A, cool down more stuff with those, and B, you can generate significant amounts of radiation with those. So if you're on a map that doesn't have, if you're on a planet type that doesn't have a frozen biome, but it's to get wheeze warts normally, like you can see in the asteroid uh, start types video, then you can get your wheeze warts from these glaciers. And it can be very useful. It can help you get that radiation science. Yeah, I quite like these glaciers. I've done a few playthroughs where our base has been right next to a glacier and we've used it for all sorts of shenanigans. I mean, in this case alone, that will keep the natural gas from this vent cool for quite some time. So that'll ease with setting this up. Yeah, very interesting. And as you can see as well, we've got the teleport, uh, we've got the neural vacillator room here. Um, this is generated on top of the, guy of the glacier, so it has cut off some of the glacier mass. So that's just an example of that. And I've highlighted on this a radio map here where the where the uh, glaciers are. There's they're, they're next to the radioactive biome in this case. And yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty big. So be prepared for that. So next up we have geodes. So these are interesting. Um, they're little pockets of materials. Uh, surrounded by mostly abyssalite, but there'll be some diamond and some obsidian nearby. Actually, yeah, it's mostly surrounded by the obsidian. You've got little bits of diamond in here, and then you've got like a, a small layer of abyssalite going around it as well. The abyssalite won't always be complete, so be aware of that. Like in this case, the abyssalite isn't complete. But uh, the, the key thing to note is of all these materials that can generate like ice, Iron ore, uh, diamond, phosphorite. Um, a lot of these are liquefiables that liquefy at normal temperatures. So solid methane, solid oxygen, solid chlorine. And what will usually happen is these will spawn on the map immediately liquefied. And one thing to note is that the gases will spawn at extremely high pressure because it's trying it's it's spawning a 600 kilogram solid tile, and then that's immediately evaporating. So you end up with 600 kilogram per tile gas pressure in these geodes. So even though it looks like a small pocket, if you break it open, it will flood the outside of the map, especially on smaller asteroids. So you need to be really careful about opening these up. <laughs> um, reminds me a lot of the Betor mod where you uh, have a hellish map where it has just random massive gas pockets that you need to watch out for digging for. Uh, you'll get these on the geodes uh, world trait and up to 10 geodes of different types will spawn across whatever asteroid the trait is on. Uh, so we've also got some solid uh, geodes here. This isn't too remarkable. Again, the mass is about 600 kilograms of tile. It can vary between 600 and 1000 kilograms depending on the material. Uh, it's not a huge amount in most cases. Um, and you'll know when it's a, a, a geode specifically because of the diamond. The diamond only appears in the oil biomes otherwise so this will tell you immediately that it's a geode that has caused this to form um so again they don't generate over uh, points of interest like story trait le locations teleporters puzzles normal geysers so they can get cut off as well um they also don't spawn in the oil and magma biomes um a lot of these traits don't really spawn features in those biomes and i'll point out specific cases where they can overlap those biomes because obviously you don't want half your oil <laughs> asteroid taken up by 
taken up by something for a world trait. But um, one thing to note is neutronium can be one of the materials that you actually that you actually can generate in the geode. Um, on this in this case, the geode is just next to the edge of the map. But and sometimes the material in here can be neutronium, and you can't dig that easily. There are two ways of removing neutronium, as far as I know. You can shave past it with rockets, and you can eventually destroy it by firing massive amounts of rad bolts into it. But both of those methods are quite cumbersome. Um, so be be prepared to have some parts of the map that are going to be an absolute pain to build anything in. It's not very likely. I, I've only seen a Neutronium Geode once uh, in my time playing this game, but it can happen. But yeah, they're pretty interesting, pretty harmless most of the time. You'll find this on most asteroids. Yeah, let's move on to Slime Mold. This is one of my least favorite world traits. <laughs> uh, it generates up to 30 small lumps of slime and algae. It's mostly just slime. There's very little algae in these. And the slime comes with large amounts of germs at normal temperatures. So between 20 and 90 degrees, these will have the full amount of slime and germs on them. So you'll need to be careful about excavating these and not letting them off gas the slime lung germs. Otherwise your dupes will get ill and that'll just be annoying. Slime lung isn't actually too bad. I worry about it too much, but it is just annoying. So it's something you should be aware of. Um, but one thing to note is um, if they spawn in cold biomes like uh, the cold rust biome or biomes on the Rhine map uh, it will be too cold for them to spawn with a significant amount of germs and those germs that they do spawn with will quickly die off. So they're a lot safer on cold asteroids. They can't spawn in magma biomes, so <laughs> you're not going to have them be cooking immediately in the magma. Um, in this case, this slime mold has spawned in an oil biome. Um, and even then, it's not quite hot enough to cook the slime lung. You can heat it up to the level where it will die off quite easily. If you just have like a couple of oil wells running and you're just letting all of the material out onto the map. But it's... Uh, yeah, you do need to do a little bit of work. And these slime, mold, slime, slime molds are quite big. You can see in this overview here how they sort of spread out like real life slime molds. They've got like little tentacles coming out. So they can take up a significant amount of space on your asteroid as well. And they could really complicate building. So I try and avoid <laughs> I try and avoid generating worlds with these traits whenever I can when I start a new run. Um quite quite annoying. But um, it can certainly make for a more interesting experience if you're into that sort of thing. Right, so next up. Geodormant and Geoactive. So these world traits only affect the main asteroid that you start with. And they'll only affect um, classic style asteroids. They won't affect any of the spaced out style asteroids like the Moonlets or Terrania, Folia, Quagmiris. Um, and what this does is this increases or uh, decreases or increases the amount of buried geysers that you have on your world. So these buried geysers are quite standard and you'll be able to find them pretty easily because they spawn in at very low temperatures, around minus 40. This is the case on all asteroids. They're not insulated so they'll eventually equalize with the surrounding temperature but it does take a while. And there's also the telltale block of neutronium that the geyser is actually resting on. So you can identify geysers pretty easily on the world map by looking for the neutronium. Um, and in this case, I've highlighted the geysers in pink on these maps again. We've got a geodormant one to the left. We've got a normal buried geysers set up in the middle and geoactive to the right. And varying from 9 to 16 is quite a big difference. Um, obviously, if you're trying to set up a self-sustainable base, having more geysers is often better. But sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want more freely available building space for like ranch setups, in which case geodormant can be helpful. But generally, you probably only take geodormant if you're looking for a more challenging experience. Yeah, um, very easy to spot these. Um, I guess I'll quickly talk about the buried geyser trick. If you want to find out what's in a buried geyser before excavating it, um, you can go to the errands the errands mode, you can see all the errands, and you can highlight the researching errand for the geyser, which would normally show up as like a five in the middle of the neutronium. 
you can switch it to yellow alert and then you can hover over the yellow alert text and it will tell you what the buried geyser is. <laughs> so you can find out what these geysers are as soon as you spot them buried, if you want. I don't tend to do that because I like the surprise of finding what the geysers are, but that is something that is something that you can do if you if you need to know to inform what your next action is. And this, uh, yeah, so the geodormant and the geoactive world traits only cover these buried geysers. They don't cover fixed formations like cool steam vents or natural gas vents that spawn out in the open, venting into the atmosphere. Um, this only affects these buried geysers. Yeah, pretty pretty self-explanatory in this case, but uh, I just thought I'd show you the what it looks like on the map. Uh, so then we have metal poor and metal rich. And the description of these on the wiki is quite misleading. So I'm just going to run through the text, basically. Like, these traits affect the generation of copper ore, iron ore, aluminium ore, wolframite, and gold amalgam veins on the asteroid. And what a vein is, is kind of, it's kind of weirdly defined. Like, in the sandstone biomes, you'll often have these caves that are surrounded by copper. Those don't count as veins. That's like a specific feature of the sandstone biome. But the random metal blocks that you do find um, in these biomes will be subject to these world traits. So here we have like a random lump of iron, and because of the metal-rich uh, world trait, the, ve the, the, the vein is a lot bigger than normal, and the tiles have a lot more mass than normal. But yeah. Um, the metal or metal pour reduces the mass of the tiles to 80% of its normal mass. And it also reduces the size of those metal bands to 80%. Um, so this is particularly noticeable on Arborea and Vedante worlds, where you start the forest biome and you have these thin bands of aluminium. On metal poor maps, these veins will be very thin and they'll they'll break up quite a lot. So you'll get less metal tiles on those than usual and they'll have less mass. And those starts already have very little metal, so you'll need to be aware of that. But on the other hand, metal rich increases the mass and uh, the mass of those metal ore tiles by 200%, and it increases the size of those bands to 150%, so you get overall about 300% more mass than the normal veins on the normal worlds. Um, and again, this is really pronounced on the Vedante and Arborea asteroids. You'll have thick aluminium bands between the different pockets in your starting biome. Um, so... Yeah, makes a really big difference on those worlds. Um, this doesn't lead to either 64% for metal poor or 300% for metal rich uh, metal ores across the whole asteroid. There are quite a few exceptions to what's affected by metal poor. So tiles and formations are not affected. So you get your teleporter area, you get your um, like your cool steam vents, your natural gas vents. That are erupting into the environment the metal that's generated with those is not affected by these traits and as i mentioned before the copper line caves in sandstone biomes and the metallic caves you get from the metallic caves world trait as well they're not affected by these either so if you're starting a sandstone biome the effect of these traits is going to be much less than it normally is because most of the metal in those biomes is from those copper line caves and then the oil biome the iron in the oil biome isn't typically affected by the iron ore in the oil biome isn't typically affected by these world traits the uranium ore and the other metal ores in the radioactive biomes aren't affected by these world traits and also the swampy biomes that are full of cobalt they're not affected as well so yeah <laughs> Um, if you're playing the swampy asteroid, like 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 the squelchy asteroid, where you start with the swampy biome and you have lots of the copper caves, you're probably going to see like 50% or less of the effect of these world traits than you normally would. So just bear that in mind. Slightly less than advertised. Um, the space biomes, uh, the, the the metal in the space biomes does increase, so be aware of that. And this only affects metal ores. It doesn't affect the refined metals that spawn anywhere. So this doesn't affect the refined metal, the refined gold that spawns near the gold volcanoes on the metallic swampy asteroid. 
This doesn't affect the lead that surrounds your random lump of uranium. Um, that lump of uranium, I don't think it's affected, but I didn't actually check. Let me know in the comments if the random lump of uranium gets affected by this. And um, the, most importantly, the lead tiles in the oil biomes will always have the, the large amount of mass. They'll always have about 2,000 kilograms per tile of lead, and that's not affected by metal poor or metal rich. So, yeah. In some, I mean, I'm not sure if you can really see it from these images here, but the... The gold veins in particular in the marsh biomes on these asteroids. You can see there's very little gold in those biomes on the metal poor one. Whereas if you look at the metal rich one over here, you can see those gold veins are a lot more pronounced. So that's a case where you can really see the difference. But you can also see that starting in the swampy biome, there's no difference at all to the uh, cobalt generation in blue. So yeah. Overall, these traits have a bit less of an effect than you expect. Metal rich makes things easier, metal poor makes things harder. Um, if you want a start where you're running out of metal and you need to explore more for that and you don't want to overly rely on, <laughs> on the metal for building massive sheets of wires like I do, then metal poor could be interesting. Or if we just want to build massive sheets of wires, <laughs> then metal rich can be, uh, can be better as well. So yeah. Similar subject, the metallic caves. So this trait is fairly straightforward. It just spawns these these caves full of cobalt on the roof and then sort of surrounded by, by granite and a little bit of iron ore and filled with carbon dioxide at normal biome temperatures. And it just spawns these randomly across the map. Like this this uh, asteroid here, the co you can see the cobalt in blue. There's no swampy biomes on this asteroid, so that's just how the caves spawn. And in this case, we've got about 12 caves. Um, so it does give you some cobalt. It is always cobalt. Uh, there isn't any refined metals associated with these caves. And the mass of the cobalt tiles isn't affected by metal poor or metal rich. Um, so you just end up with a few more of these metally holes. There's a little bit of extra metal, but it's not a huge deal. Um, Interestingly enough, the pockets full of carbon dioxide, this can be relevant on like spaced out starts. Like if you're trying to launch like a carbon dioxide rocket, having these big po having these guaranteed big pockets of carbon dioxide can help with that at the start. But I mean, that's that's pretty niche. You you probably have other ways of generating carbon dioxide most of the time. Um but yeah, not really too much to talk about. The cobalt tiles are about 1,200 kilograms of mass, so it's a pretty decent amount of metal in each cave. But um, the cave itself is still fairly small. And again, it spawns at the normal biome temperature. So, moving on to the kind of interesting one. Um, trapped oil and irregular oil. So, let's have a look at this Iridio world. We have a normal Iridio map where there's a normal oil biome along the bottom. Filled with a normal amount of oil wells. So in this case, three wells. And then the magma biome is below. Um, so what the trapped oil trait does is it is it replaces some of the normal oil biomes, which are called patch oil biomes, uh, with large freestanding oil pools. Yeah, so 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 those standard patch biomes have large pools of oil that you can just pump straight away. And what this trapped oil trait does is it replaces those pools with dry dry uh, biomes that don't have those massive pools of oil, but they do have more oil wells in them. So in this case, we've got about 10 oil wells on this Iridio, where there's less overall oil biome space, but the wells are really cram-packed together, and you can see them shown by these little star icons. And then what the irregular oil trait does is it spawns additional patch oil biomes across the map, and it replaces some of the um replaces some of the patch variants with dry variants that lack the freestanding oil so you'll notice with this iridio asteroid with the irregular oil um the oil biome is still down here there's less there's less oil wells and there's less freestanding oil in this normal biome but there's these little mini oil biomes all around the asteroid that have the oil wells in them and Irregular oil in particular can be very powerful early game. You can start at your printing pod and often immediately just wander out of your starting biome, enter an area with 
an oil biome you can pour some water on it pour some polluted water on it get it down to below scalding temperature and send your dupes in to mine the lead and the fossil immediately and that lead will help you build all of your first refined metal things you just need to make sure to insulate it properly so the heat doesn't leak out into your base but really early access to lead fossil and oil can be really impactful you can get steel really quickly you can you can get conductive wires everywhere really quickly very useful and obviously if you're sustaining a large base having the trapped having the trapped um, oil biome with lots of oil wells will really help you generate lots of petroleum potentially generate lots of plastic and if you recycle the oil properly lots of water to help sustain duplicates and the trapped and the irregular traits will tend to generate about similar amounts of oil wells across the asteroid. Um, the oil is a bit more convenient to access with the trapped oil trait because it's all in the all on the bottom of the asteroid. So it gives you more space across the rest of the asteroid for building other things like branches. Uh, whereas on the irregular oil map, you're going to have random hot pockets with oil wells that you're going to need to build your base around. And it can be a bit challenging to lay everything out but yeah the, the the real interesting thing about these two traits is these stack with each other first of all so here on the right you can see you've got trapped oil and irregular oil on this iridio and that's spawned up to 17 oil wells in this case the irregular bit is this big cluster here and then another oil biome up here so slightly less uh small oil biomes than normal but the, the bottom biome is really full of wells. So if you're trying to generate the maximum amount of oil wells on a map, you usually want to combine these traits together. Um, but the, the one very interesting thing is you can combine these world traits with the Vedante and the Oasis starting asteroids because they have innate, uh, innate irregular oil. Um, so they get this modifier regardless of the world trait and you can actually stack it together and you'll get twice as many oil pockets randomly around the map with twice as many oil wells. And there are some maps I've seen in the Spaced Out DLC that have over 60 oil reservoirs. So you can go absolutely crazy. Like, over 50% of the map will be taken up with oil biomes. And they'll all be full of oil reservoirs. That could be a very interesting challenge, because you, you don't have a lot of space to do other stuff in, apart from your starting biomes. And... You, you're going to have to build around all of those oil wells, but potentially very rewarding. You can have huge amounts of plastic, petroleum, polluted water, oxygen for your dupes. Potentially a very interesting start. This was the basis for my um, Vedante playlist, where I was trying to get up to 400 dupes, which is another YouTube video I've got where I talk about recycling all the oil. That was only possible because we had this map that had so many oil wells on it because of these traits. Yeah, it could be really fun. Um, one more thing to note about uh, these traits is they can often lead to oil wells, uh, oil reservoirs being spawned in the neutronium, like this block reservoir here. Um, you can't build an oil well on top of it because it would overlap with the neutronium. And rocket shaving this neutronium can be challenging. I mean, especially depending on where it is. Like sometimes the oil wells can just overlap with the, the very edge of the neutronium, so you can't shave off of the rocket. But you might be able to destroy it with rad bolts. I wouldn't really recommend it. It's it's quite it's quite cumbersome. But um, you can melt these oil reservoirs. They're made of sedimentary rock, um, which has a relatively low melting point compared to the geysers that are made out of abyssalite. So you can melt these pretty easily if you just want to get rid of them. And uh, yeah, that that basically summarizes my thoughts on these traits. Really fun. Give you. <laughs> Massive amounts of oil, um, massive amounts of hot biomes, good amounts of lead to start with. Some very interesting starts you can get from these. So then we have magma channels. So this is a very interesting world trait in that it spawns magma biomes in the two zones immediately above the normal magma zone. So I've got an image here, which is of a map where the oil biome has been completely overwritten by the magma channels. So you can see the normal magma down here with the very wide bands of material. And then you can see above it what's been generated by the magma channels world trait, which is 
sort of more 50-50 like patches of obsidian and magma. Um, so they could spawn in the like sort of two zones above the normal magma biome and they can completely overwrite the oil biome. So expect less oil wells on maps with the magma channels world tree. Uh, these magma channels generally don't contain volcanoes. I haven't seen them contain them so far on their own with this trait. But they do contain magma at about 1500 degrees Celsius. And they also contain about 50% obsidian. But it should be noted this obsidian is much colder than the obsidian that spawns down in the proper core biome. It usually spawns around sort of 250 to 400 degrees C, depending on where it is. You can kind of see like on the heat map, the color difference between the obsidian, the cold obsidian in the magma channels biome and the hot obsidian in the normal ore biome. What this basically means is usually the magma surrounding these will cool down a little bit and it will often be enough to cool it down into igneous rock. So over time, a lot of these magma channels will solidify on their own. Um, unless they're directly connected to the core, in which case they probably won't at that interface. Um, and what this often means is you'll just end up with lots of big lumps of igneous rock. So, uh, yeah. These biomes can leak. Um, they are surrounded by abyssalite, but there can be breaks in the abyssalite. We'll talk about this more in a minute. But that, that that can lead to cooking the nearby biomes. Like if you have like a if you have like a marshy biome nearby full of like slime and algae, and one of these magma channels is kind of exposed, heating it up um, with the obsidian, um, or even the magma in some cases. I have seen one case where the magma just has ended up dripping through, and just turning into igneous rock and just destroying the biome. It will cook all of those tiles into like dirt, sand, etc. So. With the magma channels trait, these generally won't start too close to your uh, starting zone. It's not quite like Volcania. With Volcania, you get these magma channels, but you can get them randomly across the asteroid. So you can start next to a magma channel zone. And again, you can combine this magma channels world trait with Volcania to get even more magma channels. But this trait will just add them near the existing magma biome. Yeah, lots of magma. <laughs> um, it is worth noting as well, these magma channels can appear on all asteroid types, all, all main, secondary, and moonlit asteroid types on the classic and spaced out styles. So you can get this on asteroids that don't spawn with magma, and you can get this on asteroids that, um, that are quite small. So be aware of that. Um, so... Here is the similar volcanic activity biome um, world trait modifier. And this spawns volcanoes that are surrounded by 1700 degree magma, which is quite a bit hotter and less susceptible to freezing. And about 1350 degrees obsidian. And they'll spawn their own little biomes. And again, there can be heat leaks. You can see here in this case um, where a carbon dioxide tile has been exposed to the obsidian. Uh, and that's getting hot, and that's going to eventually cook this biome here and leak all the heat out of this. So be very aware of that. These volcanoes won't spawn over um, the usual features like teleporters, story traits, puzzles, etc. So they won't interrupt those. Um, and you can see on the left how we have a asteroid where these volcanoes have spawned. These volcanoes have spawned near to the starting biome and just randomly around in general. You can... So unlike the magma channels modifier, you can run into a volcano very quickly, this trait. Um, you can run into magma very quickly, this trait. So be careful about that. Another thing about this world trait modifier is that it also spawns volcanoes in the core biome. Uh, these volcanoes don't typically appear in the core unless you've got this volcanoes trait. But what this basically means is not only do you have a massive pool of magma below your base, it will refill itself over time. So this could make geothermal power very um, appealing in the long term because your magma will be refilling itself. You will have these volcanoes here that can contribute to that. Um, and I've got them marked here with the stars in this case. You won't get too many, but I mean, combined with all the other volcanoes you have, you can have you can have access to a lot of magma with this with this trait, and that can mean a lot of igneous rock, and that can mean feeding a lot of hatches if you manage to cool it all down, and just a very very large amount of steam power. <laughs> 
yeah, combining these traits can lead to a lot of fun. Combining these traits with the Volcania um, starting asteroid can lead to a lot of fun and a lot of magma. But you do still end up with a fairly large amount of space to do stuff with. The only thing I would say is volcanic activity will make it very challenging to build like massive columns of ranches. Um, you'll have to really think about where to put them if you're going to make them really large with critter droppers. Because getting rid of one of these volcanoes is not easy. Cooling down the area is not easy. Um, so you're probably just going to want to build around them most of the time. Yeah, pretty interesting modifiers. So next up, we have the frozen core. So this replaces the normal magma core biome in the bottom of the asteroid with a very, very cold frozen biome. It's not a tundra biome, it's a frozen biome. And it will consist of ice, snow, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. And it will usually be between sort of minus 100 and minus 180 degrees C. The oxygen can occasionally be liquefied um, in its liquefied state, and you'll usually find and you'll find the solid the carbon dioxide in its solid state. So if you dig into this area and let it heat up, you'll end up with lots of carbon dioxide forming. So be aware of that. Um, this world trait can apply to any asteroid that has world traits, except for the um, so not the Mu and the water asteroids. Those those don't normally get world traits. But you can find this in small asteroids. You can find this on like the the superconductive asteroid. Um, you can find this on most places, so be aware of that. Be aware of that if you're planning on using all the magma from a normal map for geothermal, because it obviously won't work here. But this frozen biome is a huge heat dump. You can dump so much heat into it and it'll be fine. You can dump metal refinery output on this for days and pump it back out. Um, it's so cold and it's so large, it will take a massive amount of time to, to actually liquefy all of this stuff so yeah feel free to go for that feel free to mine a lot of the ice to make temperature plates with because even though that reduces the mass by 50 percent you're still gonna have loads and loads of ice to work with um although what i would say is when you do try to enter this biome try and try and enter it um with like a vacuum like have some liquid preventing the external gases from coming in and mine a sort of vacuum chamber that way you won't let any heat transfer into the cold biome accidentally. You won't start liquefying CO2 um, and the ice will stay cold for you to do whatever you want with. So that's what I'd recommend. Uh, one thing to bear in mind is that there's no there's no buried objects like these wart seeds, etc. in this biome, but it can contain buried geysers and anti-entropy anti thermo nullifiers. Um, so depending on what start you've got, you might actually find <laughs> that your water sources on your asteroid are in the frozen biome. So that could be quite challenging to manage. Um, you usually will want to get down to the frozen biome and investigate to see if there's any geysers down there. Sometimes you don't get any and sometimes you get a lot. So I've actually found a specific seed that I thought was really interesting. Um, and I mentioned it on here on the right. So this map is Arborea and it has frozen core and it has the magma channels. And this frozen this frozen core biome contains a large amount of buried geysers and a lot of anti-entropy thermonullifiers. So, and to get to this, you have to go through the magma channels and there's no easy column like there is on the flipped asteroid. Well, that can be very challenging to get to all this. You can dump all of the magma onto the frozen biome to heat it up and turn it all into steam, which could be very amusing. Um, and probably quite viable to be honest like to clear the area quickly but yeah very challenging and also the magma channels again in this case has completely replaced the oil biome so there's no access to oil on this seed until you get into space and you start mining the oily asteroid field um you won't find any of it on the on the normal planets you'll have to find it with the drill cone so potentially very challenging potentially very rewarding pretty interesting seed that I just wanted to to bring up but uh yeah this can this could make this frozen core can make the game easier it can make the game harder if you're trying to use the magma for power but usually it makes the game easier because you can just dump all your heat into it and grab a load of ice pretty pretty interesting world trait so then we have the crash satellites so these will spawn in the top biomes just before the space biome on main asteroids. 
And on the smaller asteroids, uh, they'll often spawn in craters that are exposed directly to space. So you can see here on this frozen forest moon that, that we have um, we have a satellite that's formed a crater, and then we also have satellites just in their normal caves. And in this case, this satellite is just exposed because there's no there's no rust on this asteroid. But you'll usually find them in caves. Um, they'll produce a large amount of rads. They'll produce up to 2,400 rads at the center, and that will get partially blocked by all these solids, but it will be a significant hazard to any dupes wandering past. Uh, if they're building something near it for any significant length of time, they will get radiation sickness. So either give them pills or give them lead suits if you're going to be having them near these things constantly. Uh, the free radiation uh, doesn't stop, it doesn't diminish over time. So you can just build your radbot generators near it and run your radiation science off this. I've done this on spaced out runs where I've had very few dupes. Um, quite useful. Um, you can actually inspect these for data banks, and you can also rummage them, and you'll often find random items in them. Uh, this will often be more data banks, but you can find atmo suits, you can find wart seeds, artifacts, and even morbs in them. And I'm pretty sure it's random depending on what satellite it is. You won't, I don't think you you can expect to find the same thing depending on which asteroid, uh, which satellite it's. So yeah, remember to rummage them if you can. Um, and you can demolish them once you don't need them as well, or if it's too much of a hazard. So remember that you can do that. You won't get any resources from it. But yeah, pretty interesting. And again, it only really affects the, the top of the asteroid. You're not going to find those near the magma biome for fairly obvious reasons. Yeah, pretty interesting. Can make landing a bit of a challenge sometimes. But equally, when you've got these big craters, you can actually land above them and build a ladder and sort of wander past them and get deeper into the asteroid than you normally could. Obviously any dupe that's doing that is going to need to be loaded up on rad pills or they're going to get sick pretty quickly. Uh, but yeah, pretty interesting love train. So then we have the alternate pod location trait. Uh, so this shifts the pod horizontally and vertically within the asteroid. Um, the effect is most pronounced on the classic starts. Obviously, normally your, your printing pod will spawn somewhere in the middle of the asteroid. On these different asteroids, it's spawned much higher up. It can spawn lower down as well, um, I believe, but I haven't shown it here. And you can see sometimes they can spawn quite close to the edge of the asteroid as well. So this could make it more convenient to get into space sometimes. Sometimes it can make it less convenient. It can be more convenient to get to the oil. Um, this will also apply to the spaced out style asteroids. It won't apply to the, the flipped and the radioactive ocean asteroids. And the effect is reduced because the asteroid is a lot smaller. So even though you're shifted off center, it will only be like a, a relatively little amount. Because the game just doesn't want to spawn you right next to the neutronium. Yeah, this doesn't tend to have too much of an effect. Um, usually you're not going to be, you can't deconstruct your printing pod. Usually you're not going to be trying to melt your printing pod. So bear in mind that wherever it is, it will be an obstacle. Um, if you want to keep, if you want to have, you can find seeds where the center of the map is relatively free of geysers with this world trait. So if you're trying to make some kind of massive contraption that needs as much space as possible, and you don't want it to be interrupted by geysers, this can be a good trait to look for. Um, to keep your printing pot out of those areas. But that's something to note. But yeah, not really too much to say about this, except that you won't spawn right next to Neutronium. You can spawn very close to space. You can also spawn very close to volcanoes, etc. If you spawn close to the oil biome, you can spawn close to the magma channels as well. So uh, yeah, bear that in mind. So then we move on to the sort of spaced out only world traits. And subsurface ocean used to be a trait that would spawn on classic asteroids. But as far as I could tell, you can't generate a classic style um, world with the subsurface ocean now. Because you just get the normal space biome instead. And what this what this world trait does is it replaces the top biome uh, with a large ocean biome filled with salt water. It's very similar to the uh, biome on the Oceana asteroid that spawn about 30 degrees. It's filled with lots of poke shells, filled with lots of granite, lots of salt water, uh, pinch peppers, we uh, water weeds, etc. 
Uh, and the main case where I think this is relevant is if you're picking like a Folia or Quagmirus uh, asteroid, which is still fairly large, but within the space star category, you can still have the subsurface ocean on those. So what your map will look like in those cases is you'll have your starting biome, you'll have an ocean biome at the top, you'll have a badlands biome at the bottom, and then you'll have a magma biome at the bottom. So again, that's a bit of a different start than usual. I, th I feel like the Folia and the Quagmirus starts and the Terrania starts as well are pretty underrated. You, you get like the hybrid experience of going between the classic and the moonlit starts uh, can be pretty interesting. You get some different world traits and generation behavior than normal. So uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. So you can get these subsurface oceans on the, the Folia, the Quagmirus, uh, the metallic swampy asteroids. You can get them on the Tundra and the marshy outer asteroids as well. Um, I think these are the only asteroids where they tend to spawn. So it's quite a rare world trait. Quite a rare world trait for your inner asteroids. And you'll often mostly encounter it on these outer asteroids. Yeah, sad, sadly not a feature of classic uh, starts anymore. And then next up in a similar sort of vein, we have the lush core. So, sad, so this world trait replaces the core biomes with a, a forest biome. So it's filled with trees, pips, it's a nice, comfortable 20 degrees. Uh, you find your aluminium ore in there, lots of dirt. But yeah, this won't spawn on classic style asteroids. This only spawns on secondary asteroids and moonlets and outer asteroids. So in the case of like the, the Terrania, Folia, and Quagmirus, you'll find this on the oily swamp and the rusty oil secondary asteroids. You'll, uh, you'll find this on the, most of the starting moonlets as well. You can find a lush core. Obviously, you won't find a lush core on the flipped asteroid start because the core biome is pretty much your starting biome on that on that start. So no no lush core to flip biome, and uh, you'll find it on the tundra, superconductive, and regolith asteroids as well, uh, which could be somewhat interesting. Um, so here on the right, you can see we've got a lush core generated on the superconductive asteroid, and it's also generated with a feature. Um, so you've got quite a lot of room temperature space on this superconductive asteroid. Obviously, you still have to get through all this magma safely, but you can potentially cook this forest and all these pips <laughs> and uh, do some interesting things. I don't think it would make the start easier necessarily, but uh, it's just something you should be aware of. And also, on the frozen forest moonlit in particular, this will generate a, a warmer zone that's habitable and you can still grow plants in at the bottom of the asteroid. So you can start on this moonlet and dig straight down and plant your farms there and that can be quite viable. But obviously you have to keep the cold from, you have to keep all the heat from leaking out in this case. You have to insulate it pretty well. But that is an option to consider. To be honest, I'm quite sad that um, it doesn't spawn the lush core on the normal worlds. I think that'd be quite an interesting option. Like, I'd really like it if you could generate a seed where you had the magma channels, and then you had the lush core below it. Kind of like what you've got with the superconductive asteroid. But uh, yeah, not a feature of classic style asteroids, very sadly. Uh, so then we have the radioactive crust. So again, uh, this appears on classic style secondary asteroids. It can appear on the oily swamp and rusty oil asteroids, and it will appear on... Most of the moonlets, except for the flipped moonlet, for fairly obvious reasons. And it can appear on the tundra and marshy asteroids. And what this does is it adds uh, uranium ore tiles with 100 kilogram of mass, similar to the radioactive biomes to the crust of the asteroid. These will be at about 40 minus 40 degrees, like the normal uh, radioactive biomes. And they'll be surrounded by granite and sedimentary rock tiles as well, with a large amount of mass. So. Not super interesting, but it does give you more access to uranium at the start. If you're playing on a world that doesn't have wheeze warts or shine bugs, it gives you a lot more uranium than normal. Um, it's effectively just a large radioactive biome covering the top of the map. And you do get more uranium than normal. It can let you do a lot of your initial research off of the manual Radbot generator, because um, you've got enough mass to work with. And I, I mean, I wouldn't really recommend 
setting up a nuclear reactor off of just the radioactive crust but if you have this as well as as well as another radioactive biome like say you're on the radioactive forest and you have all your beaters to do the uranium refining this will generate even more uranium and let you run your nuclear reactor for a lot longer because it is a significant amount of uranium if you're trying to do a nuclear heavy playthrough i would highly recommend this world trait uh, but you won't ever get this on the main asteroid for a classic style playthrough and you won't get it to start on the terrania folia and quag virus asteroids but yeah pretty pretty interesting trait the radiation from this uranium on its own is relatively low it's not going to pose more of a hazard to your dupes in space it's pretty much strictly a benefit for you yeah i like how it looks i think the pattern looks pretty neat too And then moving on to the last few traits, <laughs> we got the frozen friend. Um, so this spawns caves with a cryopod in them. And these caves start off in vacuum and they're often surrounded by abyssal light. Um, so bear that in mind. You'll, you'll need to oxygenate it if you find this randomly. And it's, it's basically just the same cryopod that you get at the teleporter exit on your secondary asteroid. Um, you can find a dupe in there. That dupe will spawn with the ancient knowledge world trait. The <laughs> dupe trait, not world trait. Um, that gives it three skill points that you can immediately spend. So you can get them up to snuff pretty quickly. Uh, you can't find this on the main classic style asteroids. You can only find this on other asteroids. So like the secondary asteroids. Um... One thing I didn't check, I'm not sure whether you can start on a moonlit start with a frozen friend. I don't think these will ever generate on your starting asteroid, even with the moonlets, but they'll generate on other moonlets. Let me know in the comments if that's correct, because I didn't actually double check that. Probably should have. But um, yeah, if you're if you're doing the moonlet start, and you're exploring the outer asteroids quite quickly. This could help you get your dupe numbers up. And these dupes can be pretty good. The only thing I would say is the other attributes with dupe are random. So you can get a mouth breather or an anemic dupe or a flatulent dupe or an archaleptic. Um, and once you've released them, uh, you can't put them back in the pod. So <laughs> deal with them how you may. But be aware that it might be a dupe that doesn't fit into what your colony does. Um, but once a dupe is released, all of your dupes on the asteroid will get minus 20% stress and plus 6 morale for 10 cycles. So that's a pretty big bonus. Usually makes it fairly easy to get the frozen friend integrated into your base, even if it's relatively small. But yeah, just be just be aware for any sneaky farters. So yeah, there we go. Steve and Ruby, friends forever. Um, so yeah, that's my summary of all the world traits you can find between the classic and the spaced out style asteroids. Um, I've just put some bullet points here summarizing quantities. Like, first of all, the Terra and the Terrania asteroids will never have any world traits. That's literally why you play them. If you don't want world traits, that's why you play them. Uh, classic star main asteroids will always have between two and four world traits uh, they'll never get one um, so if you want a map that plays fairly similar to normal uh, you'll probably want to like have something like geodes or like small boulders or something where it's not going to massively impact how the map plays um, the classic star secondary asteroids will always have two world traits um, so bear that in mind um, outer asteroids will often have even lower amounts of world traits. Uh, this can vary uh, between the classic and the spaced out styles, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna repeat all the text here, but just bear bear that in mind. Folia and Quagmirus um, main asteroids will have two to four world traits as well. So again, they do kind of feel quite similar to the classic starts in that they can be similarly complex. And then their secondary asteroids, uh, like the Irradiated Swampy and the Rusty Oil asteroids, will have one to two world traits. And then all of the Moonlit style asteroids will have one to two world traits. And you'll never find any world traits on the Mu and the Water outer asteroids. Um, not really sure why they don't spawn the Mu asteroid. I presume it's because of the gassy mutuals and stuff like that. But I've I've not really explored any of the stuff with gassy moves, to be honest. So don't <laughs> don't ask me about any of that. But you don't get any world traits there. And the water asteroid that makes sense because the water asteroid is so unique. It's just like ninety percent water. It's very tall. 
So yeah, I can see why world traits don't generate that. But the outer asteroids, like the Tundra, the Marshy, Superconductive, etc. There will always be three world traits split between all of those outer asteroids. Um, within those quantities. So sometimes you'll have a superconductive asteroid with a trait, but your marshy asteroid won't have any traits. Sometimes your regolith asteroid will have the trait instead of your superconductive. Sometimes, I think... Yeah, sometimes you can get a tundra asteroid without any traits as well. Yeah, um, I like the world traits. They make the game more interesting. Uh, there's some really interesting combinations you can do with the starting asteroid types. Like... Um, using magma channels to get rid of the oil biome or just using the irregular oil to just get massive amounts of oil wells on a, on a Vedante or an Oasis map. Uh, you can have a lot of fun with these. And uh, yeah, let me know in the comments uh, interesting maps that you've played on that have had interesting world traits and how those have affected your gameplay. Because uh, yeah, like stuff like the glaciers has made a big difference to me. Um, like the... Trapped oil has made a big difference to me. Yeah, um, I, li I like the system overall. And I hope they add more world traits. And I hope that they make stuff like the Lush Core um, like a classic style feature as well. Because I think that'd be quite interesting. I don't, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to generate a Lush Core in a classic style asteroid. Like some classic style asteroids don't have the forests at all. Like, so being able to spawn a lush core on those would be a pretty interesting option. So I wish they'd do that. And I feel like... I feel like adding an ocean core biome would be pretty interesting as well. Like the subsurface ocean, except it's replacing the magma zone. That could be... that could be interesting. Again, in combination with the magma channel, so you can just dump a load of magma on it. <laughs> yeah, um, those are my thoughts on all the world traits. Um, thanks very much for watching. Uh, if you haven't already watched the previous video I did on the Asteroid Starting Editions, feel free to watch that as well, because there's quite a lot of overlap between the Asteroid types and the World Traits in terms of how you're going to start your, your gameplay experience. But uh, yeah, I, I usually play Oxygen Not Included on Twitch. I stream weekdays, 7.30 to 10.30ish uh, British time. Daylight savings time at the moment. But uh, yeah, we play Oxygen Not Included on there. All the VODs are on this channel, so feel free to have a look. We're currently doing a flip, uh, flipped asteroid run with only flatulent dupes, uh, and that's been quite fun. And um, well, traits have made a little bit of a difference over there. Not too much of a difference. But uh, yeah, we're having a lot of fun with that start. And the next run that I start, um, I am planning on having some interesting world traits. And it may or may not be that seed that I highlighted earlier with without any oil and with the frozen core of the magma channels subtle hint <laughs> yeah thanks very much for watching hope to see you uh when i go live next which will probably be monday or tuesday but uh yeah enjoy your oxygen non-included runs and i'll see you soon bye for now